And now we turn our attention to this afternoon's program. And the theme for this afternoon is this life become visible. This life become visible. And so we have invited a number of people to share with us how they have experienced the face of the Christ incarnate that we might continue to see with our own eyes and our own ears how God is with us. And without any further ado, I would like to welcome a special heritage guest. She has been described as visionary, as strong, as determined, as kind, as a generous tipper of porters, and as a longtime influence on the face of the Franciscan Sisters of Allegheny. Would you please welcome our very special guest? Time to begin. Oh my heavens. My name is Marianne O'Neill. You might you might know me better as Mother Teresa. I thank you for the invitation to be with you during this time. And I've been invited to share some of my memories. I hope these memories serve you as you plan your future. It seems like yesterday that I met Father Pamphilo. He told me the story of how he landed in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Bishop Timon of Buffalo wanted a woman's community in his diocese, although he did not want it to be a diocesan community. I remember my mother sending me to the rectory with muffins for the priest. <laughs> and Father Pamphilo was there. And he told me about this new community. They were going to be Franciscans. And he invited me to come. I was rather reluctant since I was so young. <laughs> but I also could feel the enthusiasm. And due to my, the generosity of my parents, I came to Allegheny, to this infant community, this congregation that helped me to follow in the footprints of St. Francis all my life. 
Father Pamphilo was such an intelligent man, on fire with the love of France. He was always a genuine mentor to me, especially in all things Franciscan. Shortly after my arrival in Allegheny, the Civil War broke out and life was even more difficult. Gathering food from the townspeople and the farmers helped me to appreciate the generosity of others and to always try to be generous with my time, my energy, and my resources, especially to those who worked so hard and got little pay. I remember saying to the sisters, be generous in tipping the conductors on the plane, on the train. And talking about the train, I remember taking the train to New York City. I love New York City. <laughs> and I went to Greenwich Village. <laughs> and the hubbub and the people all speaking in different languages. What an experience. And it was so easy, really, to see the face of Christ in these people. In the poor Italian immigrants in the village, although they were in want, they had a lively spirit and was so eager to learn the language adapt to American ways, but also to keep their own tradition. Tradition and vision, so important. After being principal at St. Anthony's School, I went back to Allegheny. Young girls and women were of special interest to us when we were forming our congregation. We always tried to be women of our time. As a matter of fact, we founded St. Elizabeth's Academy to provide an education for women and young girls, which would be comparable to the education of men at St. Bonaventure University. The Academy was noted and acclaimed in New York State. Ah, the faith of Christ manifested in the young. Another time that I would like to recall is when I went to, off to Jamaica, British West Indies. It was really an act of faith on the part of our sisters and our new congregation. Their courage was an example to me of responding to God's call and to loving God so much they were willing to risk their security. When I went to visit them, always bringing candy, oh. <laughs> I was just overwhelmed by their warm, wonderful reception. The people of color, the warmth and talent of the children, the smiles of greeting embraced my heart. I remember when we founded St. Joseph Teacher College for women so that once again, women could be well educated. Always coming back, coming back home to Allegheny. In 1883, we were requested to send sisters to Brighton, Massachusetts to administer a hospital there. 
Once again, I saw the face of Christ in the courage that the sisters showed by going and beginning a new ministry and engaging more deeply in the healing mission of Jesus. Their compassion was so evident. I've always tried to act toward each sister kindly, firmly, truthfully, with love and affection, as I think Christ, our brother, would do. I still see the face of Christ in the exuberance of the postulants, in the seriousness of the novice, in the industriousness, industriousness of each sister, and certainly in her joy and laughter, in her tears, in her suffering. <laughs> I think it might be time to stop right now. But to tell you that I am truly a grateful woman. Thank you, Mother Teresa. How wonderful that you could be with us this afternoon. And as you speak about seeing the face of the Christ incarnate, I would like to assure you, all of us would like to assure you, we are still seeing the face of Christ incarnate. Thank you. And so, although you may hear some things that sound a little different, we too still live in that same spirit. And we have some guests with us from today's time to speak about that. And the first of those guests with us today is Marie Cardet. You may know her as the mom of Sister Lucy. <laughs> She was very quick to tell me that she has four fantastic children and eight fabulous grandchildren, and she is not the least bit biased. <laughs> so please welcome to share about her own facing of the Christ incarnate, Marie Cardet. You're a very hard act to follow. <laughs> My experience in today's world, you can't hear me. There you go. There you go. My experience in today's world of Christ living among us has many answers. I see him everywhere I look. I look around this room and I see his face. It's like looking at God's family album. And there's a real family resemblance. I think my favorite place for identifying and discovering the face of the incarnate Christ is in the children. On Thursdays, I go to a crisis center in Miami where they take in youngsters between four and 10 who have been rescued from situations of abuse or neglect they're brought to a safe place until a permanent home can be found for them. They're beautiful children. They come from all different, 
categories, economic categories. Some are very uh, withdrawn and they just sit off by themselves and don't speak. Others want to play games. Others want to just be held. Sometimes I have up to four children sitting on my lap. They're all so beautiful. But I look in their eyes and there's sadness. And in those children, I see the suffering Christ alive today in the world. On Sundays, I teach a CCD class in my parish in Miami. I have a group of children preparing to receive Jesus in Holy Communion next year. And they know, they realize that something very special is going to happen soon to them. And they're excited about it. And they have lots of questions. And one day we were discussing what it must have been like when Jesus lived in this world, what life was like then. And they were surprised that he didn't have a motorcycle, that, they, that to get around from, from place to place, he either had to walk or go in a cart or have a horse, that they didn't have washing machines or any of the, the uh, inventions that we have today that we take so for granted. They wanted to know what he looks like or what he looked like. And I said, well, you see lots of paintings of Jesus, but those paintings are just how the artist imagines him. So however you imagine him, that's just as valid. I said he probably, since he was Jewish, probably had dark curly hair and dark eyes and an olive skin. But we won't really know until we die and meet him face to face. And there was this one little girl who started to glow. She just beamed. She said, and then we'll see him and we'll know what he really looks like. Like she could hardly wait, you know. And to me, that was a manifestation of the Christ who can hardly wait for us to come home and meet him face to face. I have, like Gabrielle said, <laughs> eight wonderful grandchildren. But the littlest is four years old, and she is, she's exceptional. <laughs> she's not afraid of anything. She swims like a fish. She jumps off the high diving board. She's just, you know, straight ahead. And recently, we had a family gathering, a little birthday party for some of the members of the family. And she got up and made an announcement. She said, I love Jesus forever, even when I'm on time out. <laughs> now that expression, if you're not familiar with it, is what we say today when we're giving a mild punishment to a child and making them sit at one side of the room. We used to just say, oh, go to your room. <laughs> you know? But now they have a name for it. And that made me remember or think of the Jesus who loves us forever, even when we're on time out, even when we have lost our way, when we have misbehaved, when we have somehow gotten ourselves messed up. He doesn't stop loving us. He's the faithful, loving, forgiving Jesus. So those are three faces of Jesus that I see in this contemporary world right now. Jesus suffering in those youngsters in the clinic. 
the Jesus who can't wait to see us when we come home and meet him face to face, and then we will really know what he looks like. And the Jesus who loves us forever, even when we're on time out. Thank you. No, Marie, you're not going on time out. I want to thank you so much for, um, on behalf of the Franciscans who have gone before us, for those of us who are presently Allegheny Franciscans, and for future Allegheny Franciscans for telling your story, for your sight to see the face of Christ incarnate, and for giving us your daughter. Now, Mother Teresa, you may be surprised to know that Marie is a member of the Franciscan Sisters of Allegheny. She is an associate member, something new to carry the face of Christ forward. I, I love to see what you're doing now because it reminds me that you're in relationship. It's no longer just. Allegheny Franciscans, but it's Allegheny Franciscans in relationship. And those people who are our associates, how wonderful, just wonderful. What vision. <laughs> I'd like to call forward another one of those associates. And her name is Judy Raydell. She is the co-director of the associate program. And Judy works in Florida, and she is a state-approved provider for developmentally disabled. And she does assessment in terms of what they might need for services and care. You can just imagine the face of Christ that Judy sees. Thank you for coming to share. Mother Teresa, this past year, Sister Frances Leo and I have been traveling through Region 1, 2, and 3, visiting with your sisters, associates, men and women that journey with them, and experiencing the face of Christ. It has been a wonderful opportunity, and both Sister Frances Leo and I thank you for that opportunity of sharing Christ with us. We've not yet journeyed to Jamaica or Brazil, but maybe someday. When we greeted the sisters and the associates this past year, we chose to use a greeting that we heard at the North America Conference of Associates and Religious. 90 religious congregations have formed together with their associates to further the associate movement and to see how we can journey together to become a faith community to experience Christ more fully in our world today. I would like to extend to you the same greeting that we extended to the sisters that we have visited with so far and to the Brazilian and Jamaican sisters that we have not had an opportunity to meet with. I bow to the mystery. I bow to the God within you. Thank you. We have, in the last year, had so many opportunities to just enjoy your being and to experience what God must see. You're doing is monumental. But I think the most important thing that we have experienced is your love and the love that you extend to the people, your being. And it comes across so beautifully. 
I have been asked for the rest of the afternoon here for my part of the talk to share with you what has been my personal journey with Jesus Christ. And my personal journey may be a little bit different than some of you. I was born into a poor family. The full circumstances of my birth I did not know for 36 years. My mother was not aware of the fact that she was pregnant nor was the family aware that she was pregnant. Needless to say, one morning, they had a marvelous surprise when I showed up. I found out 36 years later that this family was also grappling with the dilemma of a pregnancy. The older daughter was pregnant and was expecting a child within a month. And the family was so poor that at that point, they could not afford to consider raising another child. So I was taken to Utica to St. Joseph's Orphanage. And from there I was adopted by the Raydell family, whose name is my name today. And I experienced love for the first time through Olive and Cliff, who to me were my mother and dad. And I think more than that, I learned the meaning of what it meant to be an adopted child of God. I found out that you didn't have to be flesh and blood to be loved, and that love embraces. One of the conditions of the adoption was that I receive a parochial school education because mother and dad were not practicing Catholics. They had their own faith and their own belief in God but it didn't quite match anybody else that believed and practiced the Catholic faith at the time. So since mom and dad were living in Utica, which was part of Blessed Sacrament Parish, I became acquainted with the Franciscan sisters at age five when I was sent to Blessed Sacrament School. There, these sisters furthered to help me understand what it means to love and to know Jesus Christ. You may know many of the sisters that were there at the time, and they may have touched your lives as well. Mother Ellen was the principal. Sister Tracy Eugene was the first grade sister, and the sister who prepared me for First Holy Communion. We already had lay teachers because of the scarcity and the need for sisters and other missions. So I had lay teachers in second and third and fourth, Sister Marie James in fifth, and we never knew quite what she did to deserve it, but she got us again in seventh. <laughs> and Sister James Francis was an, our eighth grade teacher. My Catholic school education was provided by the Sisters of Charity at Utica Catholic Academy. After graduating from Utica Catholic Academy, I entered your congregation and was a member of your congregation from 1961 to 1964. I never thought I would leave your congregation. What happened is one of the sisters became sick and I was sent to substitute for sister because she was going to be out for two weeks. And she had had one sort of problematic little fella that I was kind of advised might cause some problem and difficulty. And he was true to form and managed to do everything that he knew to make sure that I would pay attention to him. And when class was over, I put my hand on his shoulder and said, I think you better stay after school. We need to kind of talk. So I sat down with him, and the first thing he said to me is, if you saw my brothers, you would think I was special. And I had to say to him that although he was special because he was a creation of God, there were some other areas of his behavior that did quite meet the definition of special. So I called up to the mother house and got permission to take him home. When I went into the house, what I found was the mother had two profoundly retarded twins. 
Can't hear me? Okay. These, better this way? Okay. The uh, twins were crawling, they're 13 year old twins that were crawling around on the floor. When I was growing up, we had a friend who lived next door to Rome State School. And since I was raised as an only child, I wanted a child to play with. So I went next door to this big house, not knowing that it was the second largest institution for the mentally retarded in the world, Rome State School. And the staff there taught me how to play with the mentally retarded children, how to feed them, position them, relate to them. What I had not realized over the years is I had received a full training in how to work with the mentally retarded. After I had come back to the mother house, we received a number of calls from other families in the community. And Reverend, Joan, Reverend Mother Joan Marie said to me, maybe we need to pray about this. Maybe God is calling you in a different way. So we did. And for a while, the telephone call stopped, and I was delighted. And then they began again. And one day, she sent Sister Angela Marie with me. And we went to this family with this very severely disabled child. And on the way back, we were walking by the cemetery. And Sister was sharing with me that, again, I had a unique gift. And maybe God was calling me in another direction. So it was decided that I would not renew vows. I would leave and see what really God wanted in my life. And three years later, I met again with Reverend Mother Joan Marie. The day I was to leave, Sister Angela Marie spoke to me and simply said, go with God. And I have to say to you that the last years have been a tremendous experience of journeying with God. I have been involved with the mentally retarded for 24 years, was working with them and serving them mainly in the northern part of New York. And I learned so much from them. I learned how to really experience unconditional love. I learned how to accept your condition. And I have to say to you that they gave me far more than probably I ever gave to them. I saw abuse that was unbelievable. And sometimes I wondered and asked God why. You would see physicians who had terribly disabled children, artists who had children that were blind, dancers who had children that could not walk. And I would see these parents come and spend the day with us and give of their talents and their gifts only to go and hold their own child and cry and ask why and try somehow to support them with my faith and love. I learned that poverty is more than just money. I met families who had unbelievable resources and yet were so spiritually poor and in need of God's love. So I simply want to say to you, thank you. Thank you for reflecting the love of God to me. Thank you, Judy. Please be seated. This woman that you work with, one of our sisters, uh, Frances Leo, you said? Yes. Is she here today? Yes, she is. Oh, I haven't met her. <laughs> How do you do? It's good to see How you do after you? all these years. Thank you so much. <laughs> you give it to you. You've done good. <laughs> I 
I want to thank Judy for being faithful to our mission statement by seeing the dignity in every person and by being an equal partner with us. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. And in God's kingdom, there is always more. And in, we have another guest with us this afternoon. Her name is Marcy Biddleman, and she brought with her her father, Merritt Biddleman. And I'd like to, uh, Merritt to stand, please. May we welcome you. <laughs> Mr. Biddleman is a longtime resident uh, in this area, relocating to St. Petersburg, where Marcy currently works. He is also a member of the Seneca Nation, so we are w glad to have you with us, Mr. Biddleman. Welcome. <laughs> now, Mother Teresa, Marcy also has a special connection with the Franciscan Sisters of Allegheny. She's a member of your foundation board, and she is director of a free clinic in St. Petersburg, and she'll tell us about that. Marcy? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. I'm going to tell you about my personal journey. The St. Petersburg Free Clinic was the beginning of I, I have uh, described it in many ways. It was the beginning of a spiritual journey. It was the beginning of my quest to improve myself personally. It was my opportunity to find out the other part of me. And I'll tell you how that came about. In 1970, I came out of the uh, United States Marine Corps. I spent nine years there. And I was a drill instructor at Paris Island. So I seldom have problems when I'm speaking to groups. Everybody usually behaves. <laughs> but I learned a lot of things. I learned about confidence. I learned about competency. I learned to be efficient. And those, all of those skills have, um, have been good for me and have stood well all of the tests that I've had to go through. When I came out of the Marine Corps, 1973, I wanted to come back and go to school. I went to the University of South Florida. And I took the opportunity to, uh, I wanted to volunteer in the community. And I went to a volunteer action uh, center meeting one evening. And lo and behold, the only seat left open in that entire room was next to a Catholic nun. And her name was Sister Mar uh, Ann Brooks. And I sat down next, next to Sister Ann, and that was the beginning of my free clinic life. And her words were, uh, at the moment, weren't uh, really didn't sound too bad. She said, why don't you spend a couple of hours at the free clinic on Saturday? And that was in 1973. So she certainly had a plan in mind. And she was a good mentor. And I thought that no one could ever replace her. And I learned a lot of things about myself and things to do differently about working with people. And then Sister Ann went on to become a physician and in fact, at the age of 47, went to medical school. So I have always had a very, um, uh, I am impressed to say the least with the tenacity and this quest for knowledge that she had to go on and start an entire new profession and one that was so technically uh, involved. But she now is a physician at Tutwiler, in Tutwiler, Mississippi at a small clinic, in fact, is the only clinic in about a 50 mile radius doing a wonderful job. I thought she could not be replaced at the free clinic. I was the president of the board of directors there, and we brought a Catholic nun to run the free clinic, and her name was Sister Margaret Freeman. And for those who know her, she was amply, she amply filled, filled the shoes of Sister Anne. In fact, she brought her own shoes. 
And she did a wonderful job for 17 years, and we were friends for that entire time. In 1990, Sister Margaret said, it's your turn. And I left. I was working with state government, and I was a senior administrator over in the Palm Beach area. And so I was still using all those skills of competency and of uh, efficiency and getting the job done. And Sister Margaret said, it's time to come to the free clinic. I didn't necessarily think that it was God speaking, but if you ever heard her speak, you would, you'd be pretty close to wondering. And she wanted, she was another person who had that love of the free clinic, and that's one thing that we shared so deeply, was what we were doing for people. The hungry, the homeless, and the medically underserved, 4,600 people a month we're seeing at the St. Petersburg Free Clinic. And Sister Margaret brought me there to continue that work. But I'll tell you, it wasn't easy. Um, I learned also to be very confident. Uh, I always, uh, if I wasn't right, I certainly thought I was. And if you know Sister Margaret, that was a deadly combination because she thought she was right. And we were great when we were both right on the same subject. <laughs> but when we weren't, it was difficult. And I learned one of my greatest lessons. And it was one of those things that you talk about hearing a voice. And I was in conflict one day. I'm sure Sister Margaret was, too, because she was across the desk. And we were trying to resolve something between us. And a voice, as clear as any voice could be, said to me, and it was off to my left. I'll tell you how real it was to me. I turned to look. I thought someone had walked into the office with us. Said to me, you don't always have to be first. And I sat there for the longest time, quietly, and I noticed that as I quieted down and calmed down and realized that Sister Margaret also quieted down, calmed down, and we never really had a conflict after that moment. And I think that was one of the greatest lessons. And who spoke the words? I don't know. But it was someone who believed so strongly in people, someone who wanted this to work, and I can believe that Christ was in the room and was trying to help this ministry because I, I really believe that the free clinic is a spiritual ministry. I have never thought of myself as the executive director. I have always thought of myself as a caretaker for all that goes on there. And that's how it's been from the beginning of our time. We've been there for 27 years now. Uh, we withstood many tests of time in helping people. I have withstood many tests in time. I have a, another wonderful mentor, Sister Marie Schmitz, who is a medical mission sister. Sister Marie, I used to think that she just gave good advice. And one day as we sat talking, I realized she just listened well. Uh, she didn't do much talking. She let me talk things out. And she let me and helped me to come to some very, very good personal decisions to understand, and the one, in fact, we looked it up uh, the other evening because I was telling uh, Sister Marie one evening about what had happened with Sister Margaret and I because she thought I was so much calmer about things and I was, uh, just seemed to be uh, able to put my energies elsewhere. And I was telling her about the voice. And I said, really, what it was all about in my mind, Marie, is that I think I was being told not to be so public about things, not to always need to have credit for things, to just sit back, to quietly go about doing good work because that's how it's supposed to be done, not with, not with any acknowledgments. And she told me about Matthew 6. And we talked about the whole idea of doing good things in the closet, in the quiet, and out of the public eye. And that was a very good time for me. And I have used that many, many times, and it has come back tenfold how wonderfully that we are able to do. We've had two of the most successful years of the free clinic in these past two years, at a time when economically this is not a good time for nonprofits. There are a lot of cutbacks and a lot of things are happening, but the free clinic is just going forward. And it's because I believe of the wonderful guidance and mentoring that I've received. More recently, I had the opportunity to become involved closer with the Franciscans. And that was 
and, in, and I'm, I find it remarkable that Sister Margaret Mary Kimmons looks so much like Mother Teresa here. <laughs> but I had the opportunity to work with the Franciscans and the Foundation Board, and it was a, a chance to, I guess I oftentimes look for affirmation. And as I was sitting here, and when I first came into the room, I'm 1,100 miles from St. Petersburg, approximately, and I walked into this room and knew so many people. That is affirmation that I am living a good life because you are good people. And this is the way that my life and the free clinic has been so impacted by all of those who have influenced me. And so I appreciate you. I certainly look forward to my new um, friendship with Mother Teresa, alias Sister Margaret Mary Kimmons. And I am looking forward to all that will come. And so I look at this as a continuation of my spiritual life. And I think today is affirmation of that. Thank you. I want to thank you, Marcy, for being with us and for listening to that word, to that voice that helped you to be quiet and to realize that you don't have to be first, but that we do better when we enter into conflict and come through it than to avoid it. So thank you for that. And thank you, too, for being an equal partner with us as we address systemic change, as you do at the free clinic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Biddleman. Did he hear me? Mr. Biddleman. <laughs> she did good. wonderful to meet on the journey. This is like an Emmaus experience to be here to hear these stories and our own hearts leap, do they not? Let us take some moments now simply to be present at the table and to allow Sister Silence to sit with us as we experience the pain and the glory of which Father Joe spoke this morning when we meet the Christ. Let us be quiet together. And so grateful for what our ears have heard, for what our eyes have seen, and what our hands have touched. And we say, Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite um, anyone who would wish to address the body. We have one microphone um, in the center of the room. We have a microphone here, and we have a microphone that Mother Teresa was using there. So these are the three microphones that are open. Again, the instruction is to really come to the microphone and to speak as slowly as possible for the sake of the uh, table that cannot hear. Also, for those who are having difficulty hearing, know that the videotape is clear and there will be a videotape available so that you're not going to miss um, the conversation. But please let us be aware, and as we speak uh, to the body, slowly and as loudly as possible. Thank you. The microphones are open. I felt happiness in my heart and I saw Christ in the face of the sisters when we arrived in the mother house. 
everybody was so warm, giving that big abraço, the way we always um, said the Brazilian used to do, and greetings. I want to mention the, the, the old sisters. They look at us with such love, such happiness, and they feel, um, make me think that I'm, I, I felt loved, and I felt like wanting um, to love more so I can grow in age, in love, and uh, with a great love to my congregation and to my sisters. Thank you. I want to speak now, not as the facilitator, but as a Franciscan sister, one among many. And it was wonderful to feel the energy as we honored the roots of the Franciscan Sisters of Allegheny when Mother Teresa walked through the door. As the waves of recognition rolled through the room, it was as if I too was seeing my own foundress coming through the door. It was a marvelous way to hold and honor where we have come from. I hope this is on, because I have a very delicate voice and I want to Since we have been here, you, you have two differently named sisters because Sister Mary Belair became Sister Mary Shirt. And myself became, instead of Sister Eva De Camillo, became Sister Eva Camera. At our table, we were talking about recognizing the face of Christ in ourselves. The image, the placement of the mirror in this display is very significant because each morning through very sleepy eyes we do look in the mirror and we have to examine ourselves to know if that is Christ and am I presenting myself to those I meet as Christ. And so I'm going to share a little story about my camera. When I was stationed at the mother house, I frequented Pine Acres. I don't often put myself into a position of going out to take a particular picture, but this one time I wanted a single daisy. In 67 acres of land, I could only find one daisy. I found it shortly after I left the cabin, and it didn't please me at all. It had a very crooked petal. It wasn't perfect. 
And so I went up the hill, down the hill, around every place. And as God would have it, I had to go back to the very imperfect daisy and take its picture. I have albums of pictures. I love the, to do the photography. And in being a critic of my own, I can say the picture of the daisy is one of my best. The background is very muted. You don't know what's back there. And the picture, the daisy flower, is very prominent. And the crookedness of the petal is very evident. I can say I have sold more copies of that picture because I titled it a very special title. I will say it and then sit down. The title of that picture is God Loves Me Just the Way I Am.
share with you right now. Uh, I'm visiting from North Carolina. Uh, my husband and son and I are visiting from Calabash, North Carolina, visiting my husband's mother in Shingle House, Pennsylvania. And we planned our vacation, though, so that I could be here at least some of the days. I've uh, seen many of our sisters in the last uh, few months have been down the Franciscan Center and just enjoyed seeing so many of my family, my other family, Dan. And uh, the table that I was at asked if maybe I could share with you one of my newest projects. And that's a group of associates, Sisters of St. Francis, in Calabash, North Carolina. And we just started in March after a friend of mine and I went down to the Franciscan gathering in February. And at the time when I took my friend down, she said, Rita, I don't know anything about Franciscans. And I said, Shirley, don't worry about that. You'll be Franciscan when you leave. <laughs> so, and uh, certainly she is. And she helped me start that group of associates. And the day before I left the center, Sister Kathy Cahill, she did. Oh, there's Kathy. Kathy said, Rita, would your husband mind if you came down and uh, was in charge of music for a retreat? I said, oh no, he wouldn't mind at all. And instead of one retreat, I stayed down with the sisters for, for two retreats. <laughs> and uh, at that time, I was able to share with some of the associates there, Mr. Francis Leo and, and Judy, their group. But what I'm excited about, uh, since March, when we started with 17 that were interested, and we realized we couldn't meet in a home because it would just be too crowded. So I called. We live in a uh, modular home in a development in uh, Calash. And uh, so I called the, uh, the person in charge of the clubhouse, and she said we were welcome to use it as long as it was open to everyone. So I put an announcement in the uh, little paper we have called Village Voices and said that we would have an interdenominational prayer group and Bible study. So the next time we had 27 people, and the next time I think it was 25, and uh, in June and July, when I was going to be away, uh, I didn't want the group to stop, so uh, a lady from uh, St. Brendan's, that I'm uh, part of the parish, said she would take over, and this coming week, we have a lady from the Presbyterian Church who's going to be the facilitator. So anyway, we're very excited about that group, and I ask you to keep that in prayer. And I, I'm just very excited about that project, and it is so good to be with you. I can at least 
two more days, and we'll see uh, what we can work out on that. Maybe sing that and want to celebrate. Thank you. Is there anything else that needs to be said now that's asking to be spoken? I'm not sure if it's asking to be spoken, but it's struggling around inside of me, so I'll try to uh, articulate it. Can't hear me? How's that? My school teacher voice. <laughs> um, partly because of my own personal experience of being in the state of transition for almost two years now, and my recent several months of journeying with my brother through his illness and death, I am very taken with the part of Joe's reflection on the mirror and our seeing ourselves as we really are in terms of really being small and about our limitations and our um, infirmities and our powerlessness, those parts of some of that has to do with myself personally, but I think I'm, my reflection right now is more around religious life as we are experiencing it in this time. Our own congregation, for sure, but I, we're not alone, I don't believe, in this experience. And um, there's something that I... Somehow, there, it's, it's more than acceptance of the limitation or the infirmity that I think is being um, asked for, or at least seems to be coming to me. And that has to do with loving it. Like when we look in the mirror and we might not like what we see first thing in the morning or any time, really, but we also have a little more ability, it seems, to be okay with or to move above that part that isn't that we don't like as much. I think it's really hard for us to admit our depression. It's hard for us to admit our limitation and um, that religious life as we once lived it is no longer or what we now experience while it has wonderful moments and particularly we feel that in our gathering together. There's something wonderful and grace filled about our being together. In our everyday experience of it, from my own observation, uh, it's not there like it used to be or what we thought it was meant to be. And uh, through my experience, I have heard many sisters say um, this is not the same community I entered, or if I were younger, I would leave, or there's something wrong with, or why don't we, whatever. But, but to really try to grapple with that part of ourselves and our life together that is not what, does not have that spirit that we want it to have, I believe is, well, I know, I believe, I know from my own experience, it's very painful and very hard to do. And, and yet I'm hearing somehow in this humanity struggle and this uh, facing in the mirror who we are collectively in addition to who we are personally, that that's a stage or a step that we need to go through. I, and probably some of that will happen for us this, in these days, but it's just something that I've been struggling with and when Gabriel said, is there something else that needs to be heard or said? I don't know if it does or not, but I've said it. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. 
Anything else? I didn't really want to get up, but it seems as if there's a little time, so here I am. As you know, I'm in Lake Providence, Louisiana, which besides being the poorest place in America, is also one of the most corrupt. I don't know if you read um, the latest issue of George Magazine, the issue that came out in March. And there, Kennedy listed the 10 most corrupt cities. And of course, Lake Providence is one of them. 10 most corrupt in the USA. So we're really getting a lot of national attention throughout the, the past three years. It really is a great challenge working there. As you know, I've started a church-based community organization, something which I've never done in my life. And that's not what the LCWR sent me to do, actually. They sent me to work with women and children. But after three months of exploring all that they had there, I figured the only thing that could make a difference was to go for systemic change. There were enough programs set up which were all poorly utilized because there was a sense of hopelessness and helplessness that pervaded the whole scene, and everybody was apathetic. As a matter of fact, after the first week that I was there, the president of the parish council of our church said to me, what are you doing here? Why don't you go back? Everything that could possibly be tried has been already tried and failed. Nothing can be done, so you go back. But I felt where there is life, there is hope. So I embarked on this community organization. And um, it's nearly two years, now, a year and a half since I've started it. And we are progressing slowly but surely. And things are happening there, which I never think, believed could happen. And it's the Lord working, it's not me. And nearly every day you can see the face of Christ in some form or the other. You see the face of Christ in the suffering blacks who live on one side of the lake because they know it is racially polarized, with the whites living on one side of the lake and the blacks on the other. And I think the main problem there, of course, is because the churches have failed through the years. And that's why the situation exists. And there's so much corruption. Corruption is the order of the day. So that's something that has to be changed but only through prayer and working through the churches through our Christian faiths and beliefs. And Christ is seen in the faces of the poor blacks who have no hope, who are living on welfare, malnourished, don't know where to turn, and not willing to try anything because they feel everything has been tried and failed. To try to get some hope into those people again it's quite a challenge, only Christ can do that. And I can see his faith, face in all their hurt, feel their pain, and weep with them. But I also rejoice too, because I know that after every Good Friday, there is an Easter Sunday. Their Easter Sunday will come. Maybe not in my day, I may never see it. Not from this world anyway but I'm absolutely convinced it will come. So that's why I press along with the work day after day and know that the Lord is in the midst of it from the progress that's been made. It's not me. It's the face of Christ incarnate being seen by the people around. Thank you. And to your applause, I add my thanks 
to all those who have shared this afternoon. The sharing is just begun. We still have the whole week. There is always more in the kingdom. So thank you, Marcy, Marie, Judy. Thank you, Mother Teresa, for coming and being with us. And I understand, Mother Teresa, before you must go on your next appointment, you have a few closing words for us, a blessing, perhaps. <laughs> Cues. Oh, I have to be wired. I want to thank us for being here and for sharing so wonderfully. I wish you could see yourselves from my point of view right here. It's wonderful. The faces, the face of Christ. So I would like to offer a blessing. Could you please stand? Let us always recognize that we are in fleshed grace. May we be passionate always with the love of God and generous. May God bless you and keep you. May God show God's face to you and be gracious to you. May God smile upon you and give you peace. May God bless you. <laughs>